They sound good today, don't they? Amen. Saw a couple of things there that I didn't think I would see. Delonda was pulling an Anthony, singing when she wasn't supposed to. <laughs> and I believe we almost seen Jennifer speechless. So <laughs> I said, I believe we almost saw you speechless. Something else I never thought we would see. <laughs> oh, me. <man. laughs> Amen. Uh, you did, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I should have said that. <laughs> oh, goodness. Isn't it good to be able to laugh in church? Amen. Amen. We'll go ahead and let the children make their way back to the rooms. Uh, uh, older children in Angie's room. Uh, the younger ones over in Ellen's room. Got Ellen back with us today. And this morning, I ask that you go ahead and take your Bibles. And for the final time, Turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians. And t- today we're going to conclude this great letter by looking at the last 10 verses here in chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 to 28. Now we began this study way back in August. And if you've been with us throughout, you know that within this letter, God through the Apostle Paul, has been revealing to us the example or the model that we are to follow. Uh, We began there in chapter 1 by looking at the early church in Thessalonica, which is the model church that all other churches should strive to follow. Uh, From there, we went to chapter 2 where we studied the Apostle Paul and what the model servant should look like. In chapter 3, we looked at the model Christian walk and Finally, here in chapters 4 and 5, we've spent 10 weeks uh, seeing what God desires out of the model believer. And in particular, here over the past few weeks, we've been studying God's will uh, for every believer. And we've learned that that will, according to this letter in 1 uh, Thessalonica, is actually threefold. Uh, God desires for the believer to rejoice forevermore. He desires for us to pray without ceasing. And finally, as we saw last week, he desires for us to be thankful in all things. Every believer here today has reason to be thankful. And last week, we saw through the Bible that we are to be thankful for a number of things. Uh, We should be thankful for the provisions of life, uh, our food, our shelter, our clothing that we're all blessed with. If you're a believer here this morning, you should be thankful that you receive the word of God. Because it is the word of God that saves you and is effectually working in your lives. This morning you should be thankful that God chose you. He chose you before you ever chose him. He chose you before the foundation of the world. You can be thankful this morning because you have an incredible inheritance awaiting. Today you should be thankful also for your spiritual healing. Uh, Many of us were corrupt and walking in darkness for years until God shined the light on us and healed us spiritually. And finally this morning you should be thankful for God's unspeakable gift, the gift of his beloved son, Jesus Christ. Now today the Bible gives the believer two more commandments that we are to strive to follow. We're going to see that we are not to smother God's divine influence. And secondly we're going to see that we are not to disregard God's divine word. And after these two commandments are issued there in verses 19 and 20, Paul was going to reveal to us how that can be accomplished in each of our lives. So with that brief introduction, let's just jump right in here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and begin reading in verse 19. We're told, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Let us pray. 
Father God, we come to you today, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that we can feel your presence in this place, Lord, the attitude of worship that the people have come with today. And uh, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you'll just show us great things from your word, from the scripture. Lord, as we conclude this message, Lord, we thank you, Lord. I know it's been a challenging uh, study, but Lord, I think we're all better off for it. And Lord, I just pray that you'll just allow us to end here on a strong note. Lord, open our eyes, Lord, to the things uh, uh, that are from you. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you would just allow us to lay the distractions aside for just a few moments here, Lord, and just focus in on your word, Lord. We just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we begin here in verse 19 where we're told not to quench the Holy Spirit. Now time simply isn't going to allow us this morning to take an in-depth look at the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But I think there's a few things we need to know in order to have a better understanding as to why we're being warned not to quench the Holy Spirit of God. Now to begin with this morning, the Holy Spirit is not a ghost. Amen? Amen. The Bible reveals to us that he is a person just like God the Father and God the Son. The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity which has existed for all of eternity. And we are first introduced to the Spirit of God in the second verse of the Bible. We're told in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So here we see that the Holy Spirit was present and active from the very beginning. He's always played a vital role in God's divine plan. But Jesus reveals to us in the Gospels that the Holy Spirit could not become active in our lives until he returned to heaven. Jesus tells us in John chapter 16, verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And we know that after Jesus ascended to heaven on the day of Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit made his dramatic arrival there in the book of Acts. And now he dwells within those people who have called upon the name of Jesus Christ. He is a gift that God has given every believer here this morning. We're told in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, he's preaching to the people there in Jerusalem, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That is God's commandment to all people. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is a gift that God has given every believer. Now the question becomes, what is the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life? A lot of people have a, a lot of different thoughts about this. How does he influence us? What does he do in our lives? Well, I think the best place to go for that answer is to the person of Jesus Christ. He tells us all about the Holy Spirit. There's a number of things that he does. First, the Holy Spirit cares for us as believers. Listen to the words of Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 26. Jesus says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So here Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as a Comforter. He is a helper. He is a divine assistant, so to speak. He's there to give the believer strength, especially, I think, during times of trials and, and tribulation, strength in times of persecution. Jesus also tells us here within the verse that he's a teacher. He's the spirit of truth who teaches us in the ways of God and points us to the person of Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit cares for us as believers. And not only does he care for the believer, but he convicts the believer. Listen again to the words of Jesus in John chapter 16, beginning in verse 7. There he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. 
And when he has come, he will reprove, he will convict the world of its sin and of righteousness and judgment. So the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. Now, I know a lot of people, especially in the day and time we live in, don't like conviction. But I stand before you this morning to tell you that conviction is a good thing. It is a good thing. It means the Holy Spirit is present and active in your life. As a pastor, I get concerned when people who are professing the name of, of Christ don't have conviction over their sin. And I get concerned for two reasons. Number one, if the Holy Spirit is not convicting you in your life, then he's not present in your life, which means maybe you never did accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. And number two, if you can't hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, then your sin has drowned him out. Your sin has drowned him out. I get concerned when believers don't, lie, don't have conviction in their lives. So the Holy Spirit convicts us. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit guides us in the ways of truth. Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, whatever he hears from the Father and the Son, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. So the Holy Spirit guides us in the truth. And finally this morning, the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus Christ. Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 14, He, referring to the Holy Spirit, shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So as we can see here, the work of the Holy Spirit is absolutely crucial in the believer's life. The Holy Spirit cares for us. He convicts us. He shows us what the truth is. And finally, he glorifies our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And for those reasons alone this morning, I think we're told in our text that we are not to quench the Spirit. We're not to suppress him or we're not to restrain his activity in our lives. We're not to stifle his influence. The idea, I think, here is that as believers, we are not to douse the fire of God's spirit with sin. That's what the verse means. We're not to douse the fire of God's spirit with sin, whether it be the sin of disobedience, the sin of idolatry, sexual sin. It doesn't matter. Sin is what quenches the Holy Spirit. When you choose to sin, you are disregarding the Spirit in your life. You're disregarding His care. You're disregarding uh, His conviction. You're disregarding the truth. And worst of all, you're disregarding Jesus Christ. And here's the danger. The more you disregard the Holy Spirit, the harder and harder it is to hear His voice. Amen. It's harder and harder because His voice is eventually drowned out by sin. And the desires of your heart. And if you're not careful. Like we saw last week in Romans chapter 1. If you continue in your sin. If you continue to quench the Holy Spirit. God will eventually give you over. To the lust of your heart. That's not what you need. But if that's what you want. He'll give it to you. But I don't think that's the worst of all of it. No the worst of all of it I think. Is in the book of Isaiah. Listen to what we're told in Isaiah chapter 63, beginning in verse 7. This is Isaiah, the prophet, speaking. He says, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed upon us and the great goodness towards the house of Israel, which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindness. For God said, surely they are my people, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Savior. Jesus is our Savior. In all their affliction, he was affliction, afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them and he bare them and he carried them the days of old. But they rebelled and vexed the Holy Spirit. They quenched the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. Do you see the danger in quenching the Holy Spirit here? 
I don't know about you today, but I have enough problems to deal with Amen. without God turning and actively fighting against me. That's the last thing I need. I want God on my side. Amen. That's the reason we are not to quench the Holy Spirit. We don't need to smother his divine influence. Secondly, this morning, don't disregard God's word. We're told there in verse 20 of our text that we're not to despise prophesyings. Now, I think what typically comes to mind when we think of prophesying or prophecy is an Old Testament prophet foretelling a future event that will happen in God's divine plan. And that's certainly true. But prophecy goes beyond that. In fact, the entire Word of God, the entire Bible is considered prophecy. Listen to what we're told in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. We're told we have also a more sure word of prophecy, the Bible. Whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, the scriptures shine in darkness until the day dawn, until the day star arises in your hearts, until Christ arises in your hearts. Knowing this first, this is the first thing you need to know and understand about the Bible. That prophecy of the scriptures, both the Old and New Testament, is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So here we're told that the Bible is God's prophecy. The Bible tells us here that it didn't originate from man. According to the scriptures, God spoke. The Holy Spirit heard those words. He then moved in the hearts of certain men. And then those men put God's word to paper. That's what we have in the Bible. The Bible is God's prophecy. And when the man of God preaches from the word of God, he is prophesying. He is prophesying. His discourse, the preacher's discourse, is not his own. But rather it's originating from the divine inspiration of God's word. Whether that preacher is declaring the purposes of God, admonishing sin in your life, comforting the afflicted, or revealing those things that are hidden. It is God's word. And the man of God is nothing more than a mouthpiece, an instrument that God uses to relay his divine word. And if a man is truly preaching the word of God, then his words should be taken very seriously because they're not his words. They're God's words. They're divine in nature. To disregard God's word is to disregard Jesus Christ because the Bible tells us that Jesus is the word made flesh. Jesus is the Bible veiled in human flesh. It is the divine word that has the power to save your soul. It is the divine word that has the power to teach you in the ways of God. It is the, the, the divine word that comforts you and blesses your very soul. So these are the two commandments we are given here this morning. Don't smother the Holy Spirit and don't disregard God's word. Now the question becomes, I think, well, how do we accomplish that? How do we accomplish that in our lives? Well, Paul gives us three things we must do there in verses 21 and 22. First, in order to keep the Holy Spirit burning and God's Word actively working in your life, you must test all things. Look at what we're told there in verse 21. We are to prove, which means we are to test all things. Now, I think that means we are to test all things, but I think all things fall into two specific categories. This morning, as a believer, you need to test the spirits, and secondly, you need to test the people in your life that is teaching the Word of God. Listen to what we're told in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. We're told, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Here we're told that we are to test the spirits. Now why is that? Why is that? Well, I think the answer is obvious because there's more than one spirit. Okay? There's the Holy Spirit of God. 
And then there are demonic spirits. The Bible tells us that there are powers and principalities at play all around us. We can't see them. And it's up to us as believers to determine which is which. I know at times in my life it's very easy to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit uh, versus all the other voices that I'm bombarded with. And yes, I hear voices, so uh, maybe I'm crazy. But you do too, don't you? Amen. You do too. Sometimes I know with certainty that the Holy Spirit is speaking to me in that still, small voice, asking me to do something, convicting me over something. Other times I hear a voice, and it's as if Satan himself is whispering in my ear. You ever heard that voice? I think, where in the world did that thought come from? Nothing more than Satan himself. It's very evident. But I think there's other times in life that it's harder to tell the difference between the two voices. It's harder to distinguish. So let me give you a surefire test to help you determine the Holy Spirit's voice from all other voices. And that test is this. This is the truth you need to understand. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, will never contradict the Word of God. Okay? He will never contradict the Word of God. If there's a voice in your life, or if there's a voice in your head that is telling you to do something that is contrary to the Word of God, then the voice that you're hearing is not the Holy Spirit. Okay? The Holy Spirit never contradicts the Word of God. There is, there is perfect unity within the Trinity, and at the center of the Trinity is the Word of God. It is complete unity. Okay, So test the spirits. Test them. Okay? Secondly, test the teachers in your life. False prophets and false teachers always communicate a false doctrine. Okay? And we've got them in the church now. I just hear stories week after week now that just appall me. Men that I've looked up to, thought a lot of, who straying from the scriptures. Straying from them. And the only way that you can differentiate between a false teacher or a false uh, uh, a teacher and a true teacher of God is to have your Bible open. You have got to have your Bible open and verify for yourself what is being taught is, in fact, the Word of God. Never take it for granted. Just because a man has a Bible in his hand doesn't mean his teaching is consistent with the Word of God. You should have your Bibles here every morning, church. What happens if I get possessed tomorrow, come in here and start preaching a, a false doctrine? Don't you think too much of me. You better prove it for yourself Sunday in and Sunday out. Sunday in and Sunday out. And if you're around somebody that's teaching a false doctrine or is not towing the line when it comes to Scripture, you need to run. I don't care how much you think about that person. They're dangerous. They're dangerous not only for you. They're dangerous for your family. They're dangerous for the community. They're dangerous. Be careful. Be careful this morning. So if you want the Holy Spirit burning in your life and God's Word actively at work, you've got to test all things. You've got to test all things. God's Word is not going to be actively working in your life if you're listening to false doctrine. Hey, it's not going to happen. Secondly, you must hold on to what is good. Hold on to what is good. We're told there in verse 21, hold fast to that which is good. Doesn't get any simpler than that, does it? I mean, a three-year-old can understand that. Hold fast to what is good. Hold, hold fast to what is right and genuine. Hold fast to what is good and approved by God. In the day and time we live in, it's harder and harder to hold to things that are morally right, isn't it? Amen. Harder and harder. But that's what we as the church must do. We must hold to what is right regardless if the world tells us it's wrong. Don't you worry about what the world says. The Bible says it's right, it's right. And I'm going to be honest with you. Here in these last days, you're not going to find many who's going to hold firm to what is right. You're not going to find it. You're not going to find it. But that's what we've got to do. And finally, to keep the Spirit of God burning and the Word of God working in your life, you've got to hold off from any form of evil. We're told there in verse 22 that we are to abstain from all appearance of evil. 
If it has the appearance of evil, if it just has a hint of evilness, you don't need to associate with it. Because once you associate with it, you're just one bad decision away from being neck deep in it. One bad decision away. Don't set yourself up for failure this morning, church. So you need to test all things, hold on to that which is good, and hold evil at arm's length. And the Holy Spirit of God will burn brightly in your life. And the word of God will be actively at work. And look at the result there in verse 23. I think this is the result from keep, for keeping these two commandments. And I think this is the result for, for following this model that we've been looking at throughout this great letter. Look at the result. We're told in the very God of peace will sanctify you wholly. And that your whole spirit and soul and body will be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The work is twofold here. First, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God will sanctify you entirely. The Holy Spirit, in conjunction with God's Word, will, will purify your soul. It will reshape you. It will make you a different person, a perfect person. A perfect person. Secondly, they'll keep you blameless. They'll keep you innocent and free from guilt. And isn't that what we all want? To be free from guilt? I mean, I carry the burden and... The, the weight of guilt for years. And I'll tell you what, I'm not going to carry it no more. I'm not going to do it no more. And I don't want you to have to do it either. And you won't if you choose not to smother the Holy Spirit and hold fast to the Word of God. Those two things will keep you blameless until you stand before Christ Himself. And that's the reason right there we've taught this letter. So that you'll be sanctified and blameless before God and Paul wraps it up by saying faithful is he who has called you who will also do it and then he asked the church there to pray for him to to pray for him and his band of missionary brothers he charges them to to greet the brethren with a holy kiss with a hug with a smile and finally he charges them to read this letter to all the brethren which is what we've done over the last five months so that the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ will be with you. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you today, Lord, and we just thank you. Lord, that we have the truth in our hands. Lord, that we don't have to figure out what is true and what is false. Lord, that you've given it to us. And uh, Lord, I know at times it's hard to understand. Lord, but help us just to walk by faith. Faith in you, Lord. Faith in the work of the Holy Spirit. Faith in your word. Lord, we, even when things don't make sense. Lord, help us to walk by that faith. Lord, we thank you for this letter. Lord, we thank you for what it's meant to us. Lord, how it's challenged us. Hopefully, how it's convicted us. Lord, make us better people with each passing day. Lord, help us to test the spirits around us. Help us test the people in our lives. Lord, help us to cling to that which is good and abstain from that which is evil. Lord, so that you can make us blameless and perfect in your sight. Lord, you're making all things new, and that includes every individual here this morning. And Lord, we just thank you that we've got front row seats to watch that happen. Lord, I know every person here isn't where they would like to be in their walk with you. But, Lord, thank you that we're not where we used to be. Lord, help us. Help us in our walk. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Guide us in the truth. Convict us of sin. Glorify Jesus. Lord, that's what we want more than anything. Lord, we just thank you this morning for this time. Lord, I just pray that your words at work in our hearts. And, Lord, we just ask that uh, you get all the credit for all that you're doing. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask that we stand this morning. We're going to have a